Today we're considering Christ as Apostle and High Priest. And our key text today is taken in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1. There the Apostle Paul says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the Apostle and High Priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Paul is speaking here to believers, and he says there's two areas of Jesus Christ that I want you to consider. I want you to consider his apostleship, consider Christ being an apostle. Whenever we hear the word apostle, we generally think of 12 or 11 and then Paul or however you want to make it out. But he calls Christ an apostle. And then he also refers to Christ in a, in a function that we maybe are more familiar with, and that is our high priest. We are, to be partake we are to be those who are partakers of the heavenly calling. And we are to consider this. Now, when you consider something, you generally think about it. You dwell upon it. You try to put all the pieces together. The Greek word for consider here is katanoel. Katanoel. And this command in Hebrews 3.1, grammatically, is an imperative. That means it's something that must be done. And according to the Lonida, or the English, Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament based on somatic domains, we learn here that katanoel means to give very careful consideration to some manner, to think about very carefully, to consider closely. So it's not something that we just look at quickly and go on. If, if I was, for instance, to look at Brother Allen and I said, well, he's got a blue shirt on. I'm just looking quickly and I look and I say, he has a blue shirt on. But is it light blue, dark blue, azure blue, cobalt blue? What kind of midnight blue, sky blue is it? I didn't really take time to look. I just, that's a blue shirt. Just considered it quickly and went on. But this is not that kind of concept. This is a concept where you're looking at it, you're studying it, you may be comparing it to a color chart. You may even uh, get out a magnifying glass and look at it really closely. That's what Paul is telling us that we need to do concerning the apostleship and high priestly nature of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so we are to consider Christ in these two important areas as apostle and as high priest. Neither of these, we would say, is, is something, is a characteristic that someone has inherently. Inherently, I am a son, a male, a human being. I have, well, whatever color it's turned to now, I have this certain color hair, I have blue eyes. I had those things inherently. I didn't have to put on something, get something, be proclaimed something to have those characteristics. But to be an apostle or to be a high priest is different. An apostle is one who is sent forth. He is one who fulfills the role of being a special messenger. Angels are messengers. The word angelos in the Greek means messenger. And there are places where that word is translated as such in the New Testament, and it's referring clearly to human beings. But at the same time, we realize that there are angels that are angels in nature as well as function. They are angelic beings, and their main role or function is to be a messenger. Christ had 12 special apostles or messengers who were to do a work for him. But he is called also an apostle. And he's called an apostle because he has been a, sent to this earth to be the messenger of God. And we just look at a few of the verses, and there are several that speak of this. In John chapter 3 and verse 17, right after that famous John 3, 16, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So God sent his son, not for condemnation, but for salvation. John chapter 6, verses 28 and 29. Then said they unto him, that is unto Jesus, the Jewish leaders are speaking to Jesus. Then said they unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Verse 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work, the work singular of God, that ye believe on him whom he has sent. So he says, 
I want you to believe on my Father because he's the one who sent me. I've been sent. And no one could send Jesus but the Father. John 17, 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and who else? Jesus Christ. But he doesn't stop there. He says, Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Again, Christ is the sent of God. 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. He says, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Here in these two verses, twice it tells us that God sent his son. And in fact, it says in verse 9 that he sent his only begotten son. He didn't become a son by being sent. He was a son first, and then he was sent. In Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, But when the fullness of time was come, or as one translation says at just the right time, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. So God sent forth his son. Now, the incarnation then becomes a necessity. God sending his son. Without the incarnation, Jesus can't be the apostle of God, and neither later can he be the high priest. Neither can he be the judge. In verse 26 of John chapter 5, John chapter 5, verses 26 and 27. He says, For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Because Jesus became the Son of Man. He who was the only begotten Son of God became the Son of Man. And because of that, he now has the authority to execute even judgment. Jesus says, The Father judgeth no man, but committed all judgment unto the Son. And he has done this because he is the Son of God. So he is an apostle. He is one who is sent. He has come with the message of salvation from God. He has not come with the message of condemnation. He has come with a message of salvation. And that's, that message of salvation has come to us because, friends, we are lost in sin. We have transgressed God's law. As a world, we have rebelled against God. And God doesn't want the situation to stay like that. He wants to do something about it. And so he sends his son to be the apostle. But he knows that there's a further work that must be done because we need a mediator. We need a high priest. And in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14, he says, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Jesus is not simply a priest. You know, in the earthly tabernacle they had priests, but they had a high priest. How many high priests did they have? Just one at a time, one at a time. Aaron was the first. But Jesus is not simply even a high priest. He is a great high priest, a great high priest. In Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 20, it says, Whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek, you remember, was a priest king. He was a king who was also the priest of Salem. In Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25, it says, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. That is the great work of the high priest, is to make intercession for the people of God. And Jesus is this one. And we are to consider him as the one who makes this intercession. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, and verse 5, Paul says, for there is one God. Can you say amen to that? And one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. 
Now, Jesus is the Son of God, isn't he? But he's also called the Son of Man. And here, to emphasize his humanity, Paul says that there is one mediator between God and men, the Son of God. No, he doesn't say that, does he? He says the man, Christ Jesus. Because a mediator has to be able to, if he's a proper mediator, if the mediator is the correct, the right kind of mediator, the only kind of mediator possible, they must be able to understand and relate to both sides with which they are mediating perfectly. And Jesus, because he was the divine son of God, fully divine, became the son of man, fully human, he can perfectly represent both sides. He knows everything there is to know about being divine, and he knows everything there is to know about being human. And so therefore, he can be an appropriate mediator for us. But before he could become a priest, before he could serve humanity, he had to come to this earth. He had to be the apostle of God. And so I think it behooves us to look in this morning about the incarnation, because without the incarnation, none of this happens. Now, the, the English word incarnation, it comes from two Latin words, incarnus, which simply means in flesh or in the flesh. And we can read about this in the book of Luke, for instance, in Luke chapter 1 and verse 35. Luke chapter 1, verse 35. And the angel said unto her, that is Mary, the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Now, every other human, save two that have ever lived, to my knowledge, came into the world just a little differently in their conception. Adam and Eve, we know, were made of God. Adam was made first of the dust of the ground. Eve was taken from a rib from the side of Adam and made. But the conception of Jesus was different. Every other human person who's ever been born, I suppose except maybe test tube babies, but the principle's still there, there was an egg and a sperm from a man and a woman that came together and, and made a human being. But here it says that it would require the power of the highest to overshadow Mary. And she would become pregnant with this child. In Luke chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings, the great joy which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Christ was conceived in, 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 in the womb of Mary, but he was born then in Bethlehem, as the angels are telling the shepherds. And uh, this day is born unto you in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. He didn't just magically appear. He was born. Okay? Get it? He was born. So while his conception was different, he was truly human being born like all the sons of Adam. Notice from the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is what? Given. Is born. A child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. But this child is born. He comes into this world like we do. He is born. John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave him. Christ was given to us. He was given to the human race and to the human family. And by taking our humanity upon himself, he identifies with us. Jesus did not come as some hybrid being, but from us. And he came to become one of us. In Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23, it says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. This son that was born would be this, this human baby, but he was also God with us at the same time. 
There's a statement I found in the book uh, Consecrated Way to Christian Perfection by A.T. Jones. It's on page 26 in the first paragraph. I just think this is nice the way it says it. It says, therefore, his name is called Emmanuel, which is God with us. Not God with him only, but God with us. God was with him in eternity and could have been with him even though he had not given himself for us. But man through sin became without God. And God wanted to be again with us. Therefore, Jesus became us that God with him might be God with us us. And that is his name because that is what he is. Blessed be his name. A.T. Jones, The Consecrated Way to Christian Perfection, page 26, paragraph 1. So friends, Jesus became one with us, but he never ceased to be God. Please keep that in mind. Now, in all of God's created universe, and from what we know, based upon visually looking in the sky, Looking through the telescopes, the study of science, it's a pretty big creation. But of all of God's creation, there was only one planet in this universe that became out of harmony with God and his plan. And it's this planet called Earth. But God has a plan to bring this planet back into harmony with the rest of the universe and with him. And Jesus told us that we should pray for that harmony. In Matthew chapter 6, in the Lord's Prayer, he instructed us to pray, Thy kingdom come, now notice this next part, Thy will be done in earth, how Lord, as it is in heaven. You see, God's will is always done in heaven, isn't it? God's will is perfectly done in heaven. And that's what we should be praying, that God's will can be done in earth as it is in heaven. He wants it to be done here, as well as in heaven. God has devised a plan of salvation for the human race. And this was planned in the days of eternity, and it provided that there should be a Savior, even his own Son, who should come completely and fully identify himself with those whom he came to save. And becoming human was essential. In Zechariah chapter 6 and verse 12, in this messianic prophecy, it says, And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man. Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. It says, Behold the man. Even Pontius Pilate recognized that. Even Pilate recognized that. When Christ was on trial, John 9, verse 19, verse 5, Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. Jesus Christ came into this world. He was born into this world just like we are. And so Jesus Christ joined the human family by birth. He was a member of though, of the divine family, who, according to Ephesians 3.15, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Now, Jesus, who was of the form of God, laid aside that form of God and took upon him, the Bible says, the form of a slave. The form of a slave. If we would turn to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 7. It says, referring to Jesus, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Now that word that we translate servant, it comes from the Greek word that means slave or bond slave. And the fact is that every one of us in our humanity, we have become servants to sin, haven't we? This was the form that Christ took. And it says he made himself of no reputation. Now, that probably is not the best translation for most of us to really get the idea of what it means. The original um, Greek expression, I think I have it here, um, 
in Philippians 2, 7, the first part of it, literally is translated to empty himself or make void himself. To empty himself or make void himself. The translators of the King James have simply translated, made of no reputation. But the word that we translate, no reputation, comes from a Greek word, kino. And it simply means to empty. And it's used four other times in the scriptures. And I'll show you those four other places so you can get a handle on how this word, um, what it really means. In 1 Corinthians 1, 17, Paul says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of wisdom, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. You see that made of none effect on the slide is italicized. That's the portion that we translate from Kino. He was made of none effect, it says here. The cross of Christ would be made of none effect um, by the words of wisdom of the world. In Romans 4.14, he says, For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. And that expression, made void, comes from the Greek word kino, that we translate no reputation in Philippians 2.7. Another reference, 1 Corinthians 9.15. Here Paul says, But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me, for it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void. But the expression make void there, the words make void in the text are actually translated from this Greek word kino again, to make void, to make of none effect. In 2 Corinthians 9.3, Yet I have sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that, as I said, ye may be ready. And the expression in vain here, in vain, comes from Kino. Paul is saying that the one who is divine, in the form of God, he emptied himself, made void himself of that divine form. But what does this mean? What does it mean that Christ emptied himself of the form of God? He certainly retained his divinity, as is clearly stated on several occasions. For instance, we read, he would be God with us. Not just God coming to us, but God with us. So what does this mean? I'd like to propose to you that there are at least four things it means to us in the way that Jesus came to this earth. I want to ask you a question, first of all. Did Jesus, when he came to this earth, he came as, as, as one who had omnipotence. That means all power. Because it was by his word that God through, God, through Christ, created all the worlds, right? So he had this omnipotent power to speak and to bring creation into being. Did he bring that power with him to the earth? In other words, was he a human being that was sort of like Superman, but he didn't have the big S on his chest and a, and a red cape and red boots, you know, he just dressed in the common garb of people, but he was like a Superman. You know, he could just take a finger and pick up a huge bolter. Was that the way Jesus Christ was? No. Well, notice what the Bible says. In John chapter 5 and verse 19, Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself. But what he seeth the Father do, for what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. In John 5.30, Jesus says, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which sent me. Now, Jesus didn't say, I choose to do nothing. He said, I can do nothing. The, the implication to me is pretty clear that as Jesus performed miracles, as he lived the life of faith, he did it by faith and prayer and dependence upon God. Jesus says, it's not me who works, it's the Father who does the works through me. And in Desire of Ages, on page 336 in paragraph 1, and this, in, the, in the story about the, 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 the night at sea when the disciples were at sea and the great winds and seas were... were were bolsterous. It says, when Jesus was awakened to meet the storm, he was in perfect peace. 
Let me just stop for a minute. You know, if I was like the Superman, and I'm going to the, to the bank where there's an armed robbery going on, and these guys have got AK-47s and AR-15s and maybe even a bazooka, I don't have to worry a bit. I'm at peace because I know I have this invulnerability, right? If I'm Superman, I know they can't hurt me any else, so I can be at peace because of that. But is that why Jesus was at peace here? When Jesus was awakened to meet the storm, going back to the beginning here, he was in perfect peace. There was no trace of fear in word or look, for no fear was in his heart. But he rested not in the possession of almighty power. It was not as the master of earth and sea and sky that he reposed in quiet. That power he had laid down. He says, quoting from John 5.30, I can in my own self do nothing. John 5.30. He trusted in the Father's might. It was in faith, faith in God's love and care that Jesus rested. And the power of that word which stilled the storm was the power of God. Does that make sense? Is that clear? It's really not that difficult to understand, is it? So when she says, there was no trace of fear in word or look, no fear was in his heart, he rested not in possession of, he, but he rested not in the possession of almighty power. That's exactly what it means. He didn't fear, not because of the power he had within himself, but because he trusted God. And he knew the power of God. And he knew he could depend upon the power of God. Now, why is all this important to us? Well, I'm going to tell you in just a minute. Let's go to this statement, also in Desire of Ages, on page 419, paragraph 4. And this is under the chapter of the Transfiguration. It says, Presently Jesus tells them that they are now to go no further. That was Peter, James, and John. It went with him. Stepping a little aside from them, the man of sorrows pours out his supplications with strong crying and tears. He prays for strength to endure the test in behalf of humanity. He must himself gain a fresh hold on omnipotence, for only thus can he contemplate the future. Now, friends, you don't have to get a fresh hold of anything that you already have, do you? What one possesses innately, he does not have to obtain in a new way each time he desires to make use of it. The omnipotence of God, Jesus laid aside when he took upon himself the form of a slave. Ellen White also wrote in Spirit of Prophecy, volume 2, page 67 in paragraph 2, that all the miracles of Christ performed for the afflicted and suffering were by the power of God through the ministration of angels. Even in his miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead, a miracle that Ellen White calls his crowning miracle, we are told that it was by faith and prayer that he wrought his miracles in that chapter. Christ did not retain his omnipotence in the incarnation. Instead, he totally depended upon the Father. And you say, well, why is that important now? Why do I have to know this? Well, I want you to think about this. And I'm just going to try to, to bring up an illustration that maybe works. I don't know if they still do this anymore. They probably do. But when I was a kid, they had this contest every year in Akron, Ohio, called the Soapbox Derby. You ever hear the Soapbox Derby? You know, kids were to make these little cars that, that, that had no engines and just wheels, a little way to steer them, and they put them up on a hill, and they'd let them start coasting down, and whoever could coast to the finish line first in the shortest time won the soapbox derby. I guess they called it the soapbox derby because originally they took soapboxes and used that as the, the chassis, I guess, of the car and uh, put wheels on it and maybe a seat on it, whatever. I don't think they did that in Idaho when I was little. Did it in Idaho, too. Okay. I, I know that they... They used to have local competitions all over the country for this, and then they would all come, the winners, to Akron, Ohio for the, the big thing, because I was in Akron, Ohio one year, and we got to go see this, the, the soapbox derby. Um, but anyhow, but let's just say we're having a soapbox derby. Okay? We're having a soapbox derby. So all the kids have got their cars, and they're basically just a shell to sit in, two sets of wheels, you know, two axles, 
four wheels, a little steering device, and that's it. That's what the soapbox is. But in the back of my soapbox derby, I got a 427 V8, supercharged. And I go so much faster than everybody else. I get to that finish line first every time. I do what no one else can do. But I said, but you know, I never started the engine once. Never used that engine once. I promise I never used it. Would you be suspect? Would you be suspect? Especially if I was going like five times faster, ten times faster than everyone else. You do go downhill. Yeah, you just, you, you know, you're, you're going downhill. But now I'm going downhill and I've got an engine. Maybe I'm using that engine, you see, because I'm going so much faster. No one can go as fast as I'm going, it seems like, right? You would be suspect. You would have every right to be suspect of me. But I can say, well, I never used it. You know, Jesus could say, I never used my almighty power. I had innately within myself. But how do we know? If he didn't empty himself of this, how can we know? How can the demonstration of the great controversy be made plain and clear? So let's go on. Let's think about this. Another aspect that he emptied himself of was his omniscience. Omniscience means to have all knowledge. As the master of the universe, the one who created all things, was anything hid from him? He has all this knowledge of the universe. But in Luke chapter 2 and verse 52, the Bible tells us that Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Now, you can't get a, hold, a fresh hold of omnipotence if you already have it. And you can't increase in wisdom if you already have all of it. How can you increase in wisdom if you have it all already? It's impossible to do. Jesus plainly told his disciples that he didn't even know the exact time of his second coming when he was on earth. In Mark chapter 13 and verse 32, Jesus says, But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. So I ask you, was Jesus omniscient when he was here on this earth in the incarnation? When he was that apostle of God, was he omniscient? According to this text, he was not. And if, if omniscience is being part of God, as, as, as sometimes it's defined, then what about omnipotence? There's more to this than we realize. <clears throat> what about the omnipresence of Christ? Was Jesus omnipresent in the incarnation? Not at all. I think that's pretty self-evident. He, he, he wouldn't have had to walk everywhere. What about immortality in the incarnation? The scriptures teach that when Jesus hung upon the cross, it wasn't simply his body that died. In Matthew 27 and verse 50, it says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, or yielded up the spirit. But in Isaiah 53, and verse 12, he says, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the strong, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. It says he poured out his soul unto death. And in Isaiah 53 and verse 10, it says that his soul was made the offering for sin. And if anyone knows what a soul is, it should be Seventh-day Adventist people. We know that the soul is the entire entity, not just only the body, but the body and the spirit together make a soul. And when we tie these attributes together, the uh, omnipotence, the omniscience, the uh, omnipresence, the immortality together, we find attributes that we generally associate to God. But we see that in the incarnation, Christ laid aside these attributes of divinity while retaining his divine relationship with his Father, and so he was still the divine son of God, not simply because of what he could do, but because of who he was. He was the divine son of God. And, you know, if I, if I take a son, if I have a son, and maybe I cut his hand off, he's still my son. He's still human, though, right? If I cut his arm off, he's still human. As long as there's anything to him, he's human. And Jesus was divine as well as human. And the scriptures, I believe, confirm what the Spirit of the Lord wrote nearly a hundred years ago 
over 100 years ago now, at the time when he was most needed, Jesus, the Son of God, the world's Redeemer, laid aside his divinity and came to earth in the garb of humanity. Now, he didn't cease to be divine, but he laid aside those divine attributes. Ellen White here, she is speaking in, in strong words, much like Paul does when Paul says he became sin for us who knew no sin. And this was necessary so that we could have a faithful high priest that we could relate to, that we could understand, and that we could understand understands us. Did you get that? We understand that he understands us. Have you ever had a problem and somebody tries to come and comfort you and, and you just say something like, you don't understand. You don't know what I'm going through, right? And, and they probably didn't. But friends, Jesus does. And we can understand that he understands all about humanity, what it means to truly live by faith and by prayer. And so what happened in Bethlehem and extended to Calvary is possible and open to each one of us. And we don't have to have that big engine in the back of the, of the little car, you see, to do it. Because there's a law of what we might call the law of equivalence. The law of equivalence. I'm a teacher and I give, I give my students um, a lesson to do. And they tell me, oh, you know, this is too hard. We can't do this. And I say to them, look, it's easy. Let me show you. And I show them the lesson. That's, that doesn't help them, in a sense. I mean, maybe they need to know the, 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 the algorithm. They need to, need to know the protocol, how to do it. But that doesn't give them any confidence, because they know, as a teacher, I should be able to do the lesson. What they need to see is one of their peers, someone on their level, being able to do the lesson. And when they know that that lesson can be done by that person, that lesson then can be replicated by each of the similar students. And so when Jesus came as a human being and emptied himself of those divine attributes and had to live by faith and prayer just like we do, he never ceased to be the divine son of God. He was still the only begotten son of God. But now he was working under the handicap of humanity. And he showed that all that he did, we can do too. How? Through faith and prayer, dependence upon God, just like he did. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, he says, But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. He did this for every man, so every man could repeat the life that he lived. For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Verse 11. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them what? He's not ashamed to call them brethren. Well, if he really wasn't like us, he couldn't call us brethren. Okay. But he that sanctifieth, that's Jesus, and they who are sanctified us, that's us, are all of one. You see the word one there in the verse? Who is that one? Who is that one? Now remember, Hebrews chapter 2, latter part, Paul's talking about the incarnation of Christ. We are all of one. We are all of Adam. We are all of Adam. We all trace our humanity back to Adam. We are all of Adam, and this is Christ's perfect identification with humanity. He is not ashamed to call us brother. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 12 through 14, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church while I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part in almost the same, in the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is who? The devil. That is the devil. 
Notice, friends, the clearness, the simplicity of verse 14. If the children are partakers of flesh and blood, Christ must be partakers of the flesh and blood. Flesh and blood are our very mode of existence, and he came to save us, to lift us up so that we could live like he lived. This is the same flesh and blood. But friends, Jesus came, and he took all of humanity, and he took flesh and blood, and he did this, he says, it says here, to destroy the devil and to destroy the works of the devil. Going on in verse 15 through 18 in Hebrews 2, it says, And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. He wants to deliver us. What's he delivering us from? This bondage. The bondage of sin. He gives us the power to overcome sin. Verse 16, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor or to help them that are tempted. I can just say amen and only amen to that. Now we know that in the beginning, man was made in the image of God. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Now, friends, that image, that image did not include the ability to be omnipotent. That image did not include the ability to have all knowledge, to be omnipresent, to be immortal inherently immortal. But yet we were made in the form or in the image of God. But due to sin, Adam lost that image of God and he could only, now get this, he could only produce that from which he was. Right? You can't take an imperfect machine and produce a perfect machine from an imperfect one. Can you? In Genesis chapter 5 and verse 3, it says, And Adam lived a hundred and thirty years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. And we know that Seth, we are told, resembled Adam more than even Cain nor Abel did, in his, at least in his physical appearance. But you know what? Seth was still a sinner. Seth was someone who still needed a redeemer. Seth was someone who simply received from Adam that which he had given him, he gave him that sinful nature. He gave him that disposition to sin. And of course, Seth acted upon it because he needed a savior. And every one of us sitting here today are no better than Seth or any of the descendants of Adam because, friends, we, we're just simply produced from the same kind of seed. But... So, uh, Abel, he wasn't... Adam and Eve weren't born with a sinful nature. They, they didn't sin, and Abel didn't. So Abel wasn't like Seth. Um, Adam and Eve, when God created them, they had a sinless nature. Yeah. But when they sinned, yeah. but Abel their, their sin. nature fell. Um, yes, he did. <laughs> because the Bible, we know he did because the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But you see, he received from Adam and Eve a sinful nature. Now that didn't make him sin, but he acted upon it just like every one of us have. And because we've all acted upon it, Okay, yeah, they, they did. Either. Okay. Because we've all acted upon it, there's something each one of us need. Jesus said in John chapter 3 and verse 3 when talking to Nicodemus, He said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And in verse 7, He said, Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be what? Born again. Jesus has made provision whereby we can be born again. We've been born into this human family, but we need to be born into the family of God now through this new birth experience. Jesus came and he joined himself to humanity. He came to the bottom round of the ladder so that he could save from the bottom up and be a complete savior for the whole world. 
in John chapter 1 and verse 14, it says that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so while Jesus came with this divine nature, as it were, He also came, as it says in Romans 8 and verse 3, in the likeness of sinful flesh. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Jesus came to understand the struggles and trials that we have so that he could help us, friends, not half the time, not 70% of the time, not even 99.44% of the time, but 100% of the time when we struggle. He does understand, for he fought against sin, even with strong crying and tears. And all this so that he could honestly and rightly serve to be our priest, our high priest, our great high priest. In Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7, it says, Who in the days of his what? Flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Now Jesus was the only begotten Son of God, and that's true. But that didn't give him a special status in the eyes of God over us and his love. Because in John chapter 17 and verse 23, Jesus is praying and he says, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them, and hast loved them how? As thou has loved me. You know, you may think that's just hyperbole or something crazy. And to me it seems like it is, but I believe it because Jesus said it. I don't understand it. I can't comprehend it. How can God love me like he loves Jesus? But if Jesus came to God with strong crying and tears, pleading for help, and God gave it to him every single time, Will he fail to give you, will he fail to give me that same help when we come to him with strong crying and tears? Friends, he will never fail because he doesn't change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so our hope, friends, as we consider Jesus as the apostle and high priest of our profession is that we do indeed have one who is sent of God, we have one who understands our needs, who came and dwelt in flesh like we have. And because of that, he can be a merciful and faithful high priest. I come to a situation. I don't know how to deal with it. I say, Lord, this is beyond my, my ability as a human being. I can't go through this. And, and Jesus comes to me and says, Alan, I've done this for you. I can't answer that now. I'm sorry. And um, I, I, I've come to you, and I want to help you, and I'm here for you. And he's here for you, too. And if you will come to him just as you are, calling upon him for your need, not because of your goodness, asking to be born again, to have him come into your heart, and to have humanity united with divinity, then you can overcome just as Jesus overcame. And may God bless you lots and lots. We want to thank you for staying with us here. And as we continue some of our study. And right now we're going to be talking about what we call the unified theory, harmonizing statements on the divinity of Christ. Harmonizing statements on the divinity of Christ. Michael Faraday was one of the greatest scientists who ever lived that we know of. Uh, he wasn't extremely well educated by normal standards. He didn't attend the schools and the universities much. He sort of learned most everything hands-on. But in 1831, Faraday discovered the electromagnetic effect, something that today we might consider fairly fundamental, fairly basic, something that even elementary school children learn about. But in his time, it was revolutionary, this connection between electricity and magnetism. 
But Faraday was not a mathematician, and he couldn't express his discovery in mathematical terms. Because those, who, those people who know mathematics and, and people who study mathematics, there is sort of this discussion. There is this discussion in the mathematical field, and that is, is, is mathematics discovered or invented? Did we invent mathematics like algebra? Did we invent algebra or did we discover algebra? And when you look at certain number sequences, like the Fibonacci sequence of numbers, and when you understand that in this universe, there are about 15 to 20 formulas that basically govern all the universe, and these formulas all sort of interact and intersect with each other and have certain constants that rely upon one another, you can easily come away with the idea that we have not invented mathematics, we have discovered mathematics. And if we have discovered it, that means someone else invented it. Someone else, higher, made it. But it was the Scottish mathematician, James Clerk Maxwell, who in 1865 published his four equations on electromagnetism that expressed in mathematical terms, the unification of electricity and magnetism. These ideas that were put forth by Faraday, which he couldn't express mathematically, Maxwell could. And here are some of the formulas. They're in integral equations and differential equations, which of course go back to um, Newton and Leibniz to, for those things. But this is the mathematical way it's put down. Maxwell proved that if electromagnetic waves travel through a vacuum, they must travel at a particular speed. And that speed, his formulas said, just happened to be about 300,000 kilometers per second. Does that make any sense to you? How about if I put it this way? About 186,000 miles a second. Oh, now does that ring a bell? The speed of light just happened. No, it just didn't happen to be the speed of light. It was calculated by God to be the speed of light, and they just simply discovered that through the mathematics. So algebra, geometry, differential calculus, differential equations, these are pretty important to us. Now we're in the living in the 21st century, and for about 100 years, physicists have been searching for what we call the theory of everything. This was the last great work that Albert Einstein was working on. His papers were on his desk there at Princeton when he died. This is a theory that would unify all the natural forces from the force of gravitation that affects the largest items in the universe from which Einstein's theories of relativity worked on to the forces that worked in the smallest or the quantum level found by Max Planck of Germany. The theory of everything that takes quantum gravity, space curvature, uh, electronuclear force, and all these things going down to electromagnetism, all bonding them together. In other words, it would be a coherent theoretical framework of physics that fully explains and links together all physical aspects of the universe it will be the one formula with which all others will agree. Some scientists and mathematicians are not sure that even such an equation exists, while others think that it may exist, but we're probably not smart enough to find it out if it does exist. But I indeed believe that there is such a formula, and that there is because there is one unified creator behind all the forces of the universe. That's one of the great conundrums of science. But today, today. We here, we here are not looking for a specific scientific method or formula. We're looking for something different. We're looking for something that deals with theology. We're looking for a unified theory of Christ's divinity from his pre-incarnation through his incarnation to his post-incarnation, post-ascension uh, positions. How can we harmonize all the statements of inspiration 
especially some of Ellen White's statements about the attributes of Jesus that he had during the incarnation. This study may be considered in some respects a large footnote to our study that we had earlier concerning Christ as apostle and high priest, specifically concerning the section that we subtitled in the form of a slave. Because in that section, we postulated that Jesus, who had been in the very form of God prior to the incarnation, laid aside that divine form in the incarnation as part of the plan of salvation. While retaining his divinity, he laid aside his omnipotence, his omniscience, his omnipresence, his immortality. We noted some verses such as Philippians 2.7 where it says that Jesus made himself of no reputation. But the Greek actually means emptied himself. He emptied himself and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. He who had been in the form of God, the morphe of God, emptied himself of that and took upon him the form of a slave. We noticed in John chapter 5 and verse 19, then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do, for what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. We notice some statements from Ellen White. For example, in the book Desire of Ages, 336 paragraph 1, concerning when Jesus was in the, in the ship and the storm had come, it says that Jesus rested not in the possession of almighty power. It was not as the master of earth, sea, and sky that he reposed in quiet. That power he had laid down. And he says, I can of my own self do nothing, John 5.30. He trusted in the Father's might. It was in faith, faith in God's love and care that Jesus rested. And the power of that word which stilled the storm was the power of God. Because he laid his power aside. And she quotes John 5.30, which is one of the verses that we looked at earlier. And also, in the Spirit of Prophecy, volume 2 on page 67, we are told that all the miracles of Christ, all the miracles of Christ performed for the afflicted and suffering were by the power of God through the ministration of angels. And then there's another statement that I don't think we looked at earlier, but I think it's an interesting statement we should consider. Speaking of Jesus, had he not been fully human, Christ could not have been our substitute. But while bearing human nature, he was dependent upon the omnipotent for his life. In his humanity, he laid hold of the divinity of God, and this every member of the human family has the privilege of doing. Christ did nothing that human nature may not do if it partakes of the divine nature. Signs of the Times, June 17, 1897, paragraph 8. So the statement's pretty blunt, pretty plain. Christ did nothing that we can't do. We can do and have access to everything that Christ had access to. But it says that he was dependent upon the omnipotent for his life. We saw that Jesus, for example, on this earth, did not claim to have omniscience for himself concerning his second coming. He said in Mark 13, verse 32, But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. He says only the Father at that time knew the day and the hour of Christ's coming. We looked at other evidences also. Luke 2.52, that Jesus increased in wisdom and stature in favor with God and man, and, and others that would indicate this. We detailed these in our earlier study, but the question is, did Jesus lay these items aside forever? Is he now without these divine attributes today? And I think we need to know. But how do we unify these statements that we've just read with statements like this one? 
in Desire of Ages, page 529, paragraph 1. In his mercy, he proposed to give them one more evidence that he was the restorer, the one who alone could bring life and immortality to light. This was to be an evidence that the priest could not misinterpret. This was the reason of his delay in going to Bethany. This crowning miracle, the raising of Lazarus, was to set the seal of God on his work and on his claim to what? Divinity. So why didn't Jesus go forth immediately? Because he wanted Lazarus to be in the grave long enough for corruption to enter so that there could be no question about the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Remember when Jairus' daughter was raised from the dead, they laughed at him first because they said, you know, he said the damsel sleeps, and they said, no, she's dead, but she'd only been dead a short time. See? Now, before we go there, we should note that prior to the Incarnation, there should be little need to prove that Jesus was not only divine, but that he had omniscience, omnipotence, etc., all those prerogatives or attributes that we think of inherently in divinity. In Colossians chapter 1 and verses 15 through 17, Paul, speaking backward into history, speaking of Jesus, says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Verse 16, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Before his incarnation, did Jesus have the ability to create? Did Jesus have this this omnipotence that would allow him to create universes and worlds, all things in heaven and earth, visible, invisible. Well, astrophysicists would look at that and they'd say, well, that must include time and space. Even time and space created by Jesus Christ. That's what it says. In the Youth Instructor of October 13, 1893, it says the humiliation of the man Christ Jesus is incomprehensible to the human mind. But his divinity and his existence before the world was formed can never be doubted by those who believe the word of God. We've just seen what the word of God says about this. She's speaking about his divinity, his existence, his pre-existence before the world, that this should in no way be doubted by anyone. Not if they believe in the word of God. And in Selected Messages, in Book 1, page 243, in paragraph 3, in consenting to become man, Christ manifested a humility that is the marvel of the heavenly intelligences. The act of consenting to be a man would be no humiliation were it not for the fact of Christ's exalted preexistence. We must open our understanding to realize that Christ laid aside his royal robe, his kingly crown, his high command, and clothed his divinity with humanity, that he might meet man where he was and bring to the human family moral power to become the sons and daughters of God. To redeem man, Christ became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now notice that expression, he clothed his divinity with humanity, and we'll see that again. Now, before we go on, though, I just want to bring in some points that might be helpful as we consider all these items. Immortality. Is immortality the prerogative of God alone? Well, no, it's not. It would be the prerogative of God alone to bestow it. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 53, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 53. Speaking when Jesus returns, it says, For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And for those who will be living when Jesus comes, he says, And this mortal, we who are mortal now, must put on what? Immortality. So there will come a day, friends, when we will possess an immortality. 
not that it's inherent within us, that we have of ourselves, but immortality can be given, and so it is not an exclusive property of God in that sense. Did Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead? He sure did, didn't he? And we were told it was like the crowning miracle that he performed. However, in Acts chapter 9 and verse 40, we read there that Peter raised Tabitha, or also called Dorcas, from the dead. And it wasn't that she had died immediately. We don't know the exact time differentiation, but there was a time period where they had to send for Peter. Peter had to come. And it says, Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed, and turning him to the body, said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Do you remember the Shunammite woman and Elisha? The Shunammite woman and her husband had, had, had built this little room for Elisha to be in. And, uh, and, you know, he wanted to do something to repay this woman. And he asked his servant, well, what should we do for her? His wife said, she has no child. So they prayed that she'd have a child. She wanted a child so desperately she got the child. And then one day the lad went out to the fields. Um, and, and we have the text here. I won't take time to read it all. But the lad went out into the field. And, and he apparently had some kind of heat, heat exhaustion, heat stroke or something. Came home, was sick, and died. And she sent for the word to Elisha. Elisha finally came. And he stretched himself upon the lad. And... It says in verse 35, Then he returned and walked into the house to and fro and went up and stretched himself upon him and the child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. Now, at times we see Jesus in inspiration reading the thoughts of people. Surely you must be omniscient to be able to do that, to read the thoughts of people. But in 2 Kings 6.12, we read here the story about Elisha again in the king of Syria. And remember, every time the king of Syria planned to do something, the king of Israel already knew ahead what was going to happen because Elisha told him. And one of his servants said, None, my lord, because the, the king said, yeah, well, There must be a spy among us. Who's telling the king of Israel everything that's going on? And the servant said, None, my lord, O king. That was the king of Syria. But Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, tell the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. But of course, we don't think of Elisha as having omniscience, do we? Now, Jesus said that he did not even know the day or the hour of his coming. Does that mean he doesn't know it today? We can't say that it does that, because in early writings, on page 14 in paragraph 1, speaking at the very end, Ellen White says, Soon we heard the voice of God like many waters, which gave us the day and hour of Jesus' coming. So you see, friends, even the righteous. Well, sometime prior to the coming of Jesus, we don't know exactly how soon, but sometime before that time, they will be told by the Father's voice as the sound of many waters the day and the hour of Jesus coming. What I'm trying to tell you is that exercising, and listen to me carefully, I want to say this right, exercising what appear to be the prerogatives of divinity does not of itself constitute divinity. Did you get that? Exercising the prerogatives of divinity does not necessarily prove one to be divine. Omniscience is a prerogative of divinity. But God can bestow wisdom upon people, can't he? Supernatural wisdom, like he did Elisha. Raising the dead is something that human beings can't do. But God can, through that human being, raise the dead, right? And in John chapter 14 and verse 12, this shouldn't be surprising that we could see this even today. Because Jesus said to his disciples, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. So Jesus told his followers, I don't want to use the word warned, he, he gave them an anticipation that they should expect to do even greater works than he did because he was going to the Father. So again, ex exhibiting certain prerogatives that are considered divine 
are not necessarily evidence of inherent divinity through the one exhibiting them, but rather the working of divinity through the one exhibiting the prerogatives from the source of another, from the source of divinity. Now let's move on. Let's start to try to unify. Let's, let's, let's come up with a unified theory on how all this is going to work. In the Bible Echo of October 12, 1896, paragraph 1, we read this. At the time when he was most needed, Jesus, the Son of God, the world's Redeemer, laid aside his divinity and came to earth in the garb of humanity. Now, that's a hard statement. Because it sounds like Jesus left everything behind. He laid aside his divinity. But you know, how do we compare a Bible verse, or how do we solve a Bible verse that we don't understand? We find another Bible verse that, that works with it, right? And you remember we read in Desire of Ages earlier that Jesus didn't have that omnipotent power, that he had laid it aside, remember? And so what she's speaking about here when he's laying aside his divinity is not who he is, not his identity, but this divine prerogative of omnipotent power as well as other powers, I believe. Because there's other statements such as this one. Review and Herald of March 8, 1881, and this is similar to a statement we read earlier. Jesus, our substitute, consented to bear for a man the penalty of the law transgressed. He clothed his divinity with humanity and thus became the Son of Man, a Savior and Redeemer. Now here she doesn't say the same quite thing as strongly, or, or it seems like she's saying something a little different. And I'm saying it seems like that. I'm not saying she is because we're working on unifying these statements. We believe that there is a harmony, there must be a harmony with these statements. But here she doesn't say anything about divinity being laid aside, but rather being clothed with humanity. And so it's like when we read certain Bible verses. We read Bible verses, for instance, that the fire comes down from God, like in Revelation 20, and consumes them, right? We read that, and then we, we read something like within Isaiah 66, 24, and, and that, you know, the, the worm dieth not, and Revelation 14, 11, the, they burn forever and ever. But we realize, even though they seem to say something different, they're speaking in a harmonious way. And so what we have to do is we have to come to a place where we can have now a unified theory, some, some way of approaching these statements to where we can say, yeah, that makes sense. And now this makes sense in connection to that one. It was like when Faraday was working with magnets and electricity. He would have a compass, which is basically a magnetic needle, right? A magnetized needle points toward north, magnetic north. But whenever he would take a wire with an electrical current, whenever he would take, whenever Faraday would take a, a wire with an electric current running through it and put it over top of that magnetic needle, the needle would start to turn. It would move. And so he realized that there had to be a connection between the electricity and the magnetism, you see. And so, but he just didn't understand it yet. He had to come up with a theory that put it all together. And that's what we're trying to do here. Notice this point. Acts of the Apostles, page 331.1. Paul was convinced that if they could be brought to comprehend the amazing sacrifice made by the majesty of heaven, all selfishness would be banished from their lives. He showed how the Son of God had laid aside his what? What's the word? Glory. Laid aside his glory voluntarily subjecting himself to the conditions of human nature, and then had humbled himself as a servant, becoming obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, Philippians 2.8, that he might lift fallen man from the degradation to hope and joy and heaven. Acts of the Apostles 333.1. The important point I want you to catch from this is that he, he says that Paul showed that Christ laid aside his what? His glory. Now sometimes we say, well, you know, his glory meant his character. Not in this case, because Christ never laid aside his character. His character never changed. But this is speaking about something else. This is speaking about that, that, that brilliance with which the form of divinity has, that all which no man who sins can look upon and live. 
And there is evidence from the scripture that Jesus today exhibits these prerogatives that are considered divine. Yes, he laid them aside in the incarnation. He clothed his divinity with humanity. But today he has these prerogatives because when he comes back, it will be his voice that raises the dead. And, and I know we said earlier that raising the dead could be done by human beings through the power of God, right? But these references seem to indicate very strongly that it is Christ through his power that will raise the dead when they come back. Notice this in John 5.25. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they shall live. The dead. And this is after his ascension to heaven, you see. In John 5.28, Jesus says, marvel not at this, the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. So his voice is going to raise the righteous, and a thousand years later, his voice is going to raise the wicked. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Who is the archangel? It's Christ. It's Christ. He is the chief of the angels. He is an angel in the sense of being a messenger. He's not an angel in the sense of nature, an angel in the sense of function, a messenger, just like we are called angels. We, we share the first, second, third angels messages, right? Now, I want you to look at a Bible verse in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 12. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 12. These heavenly hosts are saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Now, who is the Lamb? Jesus Christ. There is no question on that. There is no, no need to interpret this any difficultly. We know this is speaking of Christ. I don't think there's any contention from any source on that. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, and riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. That word power comes from the Greek word dunamis, which means explosive power ability. Not authority, but force. He receives power. He receives omnipotence. He receives wisdom from the Greek word Sophia, the Greek word for wisdom. He receives omniscience. He receives glory. He laid aside his glory. Now he receives his glory. That's doxa in the Greek. You've heard of the doxology, for instance. Doxa means glory. He receives these things, and this is in heaven post-incarnation post-ascension, post-resurrection. Now, what does this mean that Jesus laid aside his divinity? How can we unify these different positions? I want to give you an illustration, and I'm going to give you a statement of inspiration. And this, this illustration will be sort of, uh, and, and it's man-made, it's not perfect, no illustration that is man-made is ever perfect or ever fits any situation. But I want you to suppose that we have a soldier. Okay. Suppose we have a soldier, and the soldier I want you to suppose will be maybe uh, attired just a little differently than this one because I can't find a picture to fully exam uh, exemplify what I want. But the soldier has a helmet. He has a bulletproof vest. Uh, these are for protection, aren't they? They would supply, in effect, immortality. He has a rifle. Several magazines, maybe a pistol on his side. That is his, is his omnipotence. It is his power. He has night vision glasses, which enable him to see and know things. He has maybe AR glasses, which allow him to have connectivity to the Internet, where he can look up anything he needs to know. He has omniscience, supposedly. Now, let us suppose... Our soldier who is wearing and has all of this apparel. He goes over to a table, 
He takes his helmet off and he lays the helmet on the table. Puts the gun on the table. Pulls his sidearm out and puts it on the table. Takes his bulletproof vest off, lays it on the table. Takes his night vision and AR goggles off, puts them on the table. Does he still, do they still belong to him? Does he still have them? But he doesn't have them on. Can he use them while they're on the table? No, he can't use them at all, can he? But they're there. They're there. But not usable to him. Now the next question is, can he take them back and put them on himself? Yeah, he can put the helmet back on, put the, jet, the vest back on, strap on the sidearm, put the goggles on, grab up the rifle. He could do that if he chose to. He could do that. Now I want you to notice this statement from Ellen White. This is taken from Acts of the Apostles, page 33, paragraph 3. Acts of the Apostles, page 33, paragraph 3. And it begins by saying, as in the typical service. Now I want to stop for just a minute. I have that word typical highlighted here. Typical means that of the type, right? You have type and the type. Could I, could I use as a synonym the symbolic service? Are, were the types symbols? They were a type. They were a symbol. That's what a type is. It's a symbol of something else that's real. So keep that in mind as we read. As in the typical service, the high priest laid aside his pontifical robes and officiated in the white linen dress of an ordinary priest. Now that's what happened on the Day of Atonement. But what happened at the end of the Day of Atonement? Did he keep just the white linen robes of the priest on at that point? No, he put those pontifical robes back on. He put them back on. Why did he do that? Why would God allow him to serve all the time in these high priestly robes, but then this one time when he's making atonement for the people, he takes them off? and he comes in a very common garb. She says, so, so Christ laid aside his royal robes and garbed himself with humanity and offered sacrifice, himself the priest, himself the victim. As the high priest, after performing his service in the Holy of Holies, came forth to the waiting congregation in his pontifical robes, so Christ will come the second time clothed in garments of whitest white, so as no fuller on earth could white them. Mark 9, 3. He will come in his own glory and in the glory of his Father, and all the angelic hosts will escort him on his way. Going back to the first part of the statement again, it says that the high priest laid aside these great beautiful robes. He officiated in the white linen dress of the ordinary priest, but did he stay in those garments again? No, he changed. He changed. And so Christ laid aside his royal robes, but now he changes again. He comes back as the great high priest, as the great victor. And this represents this transition of Jesus. He who had been one with God in heaven came and clothed his uh, divinity with humanity. He laid aside these divine attributes, this power. He had laid it aside as we read in Desire of Ages. As Jesus said in John 5, 19, 5, 30. He laid those things aside, but now he takes it back up. Again, just like the soldier could take his weapons and, and vest and helmet and everything else off, but he could put it back on. And Jesus did this, friends, because he had to do this to make his life demonstrable. It had to be one that could be done with a demonstration. So there's no question or not. It's like if I'm a soldier and I'm wearing a bulletproof vest and someone shoots at me and I say, well, you know, your bullet didn't hurt me. They're going to say, well, you had a bulletproof vest. And, well, I, I had it on, but I didn't use it. I had it on, but I didn't use it. Well, how do, <laughs> how do you know you didn't use it? You see, you see how that could be absurd to the person looking upon it with, 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 with a certain amount of, of um, excuse me, I'm trying to find the word, uh, a suspicion. 
How does he prove? Unless he has clearly divested himself of those things. It's impossible for people to say he played fair. And the, and, and, and the whole plan of salvation has to be played out. This great controversy has to be played out in such a way that it's dem demonstrable and fair and that it's always done above board in, in the way that God wants it to be. And it was because, and friends, this is so important, it was because Jesus was the Son of God that he had received this from the Father, that he could indeed lay these attributes aside at that time. And yet he never ceased to retain them. And that's why we can read in these statements of Ellen White's where she's speaking about Christ, that Christ could have omniscience or could read minds and things like that. But he wasn't using his own power to do that. He was using the power of the Father. But he never ceased to have those things, just like the soldier has these items. They're on the table, but he's not using them. So again, Christ, again, because he was the Son of God, he could lay aside these attributes, yet never ceased to retain them. However, for the plan of salvation, he must live demonstrably as a man depending upon the omnipotence and omniscience of his Father. But as high priest, he would put his high priestly pontifical robes back on after serving in the plain linen robes of the common priest, so Christ re received back his glory and divine attributes after his atonement upon the cross and his ascension to heaven. Now let's just talk about these divine attributes or prerogatives for just a minute. Let's think about this concept of omnipotent. Now the term omnipotent is found only one time in the scriptures, and that's in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 6. John says, and I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters and as the voice of mighty thundering saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Now this word omnipotent, it comes from a Greek word, pantokrantor, and it means almighty or all power, all power, okay, all power. And sometimes we, we, um, we may misinterpret that term, almighty. We say, well, there's mighty, and then there's almighty. But, but, but this term almighty maybe isn't the best way to define or to describe this, but it simply means all of the power. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it's exclusive to just one. I could have all the power to control a boat, uh, an airplane, for instance. Let's think of an airplane. You have a pilot and you have a first officer, or sometimes called the co-pilot, right? But they each have a set of controls. Each one has just as much power to manipulate and to fly the plane as the other. Isn't that right? Okay, so keep that in mind. But this word is also translated uh, in 2 Corinthians 6.18 as almighty. And um, there it says, I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And I listed, if you wish for reference, the other uh, usages of Pantocrantor in the New Testament. And they're all translated Almighty. Only in Revelation 19, uh, 6 is it translated there as omnipotent. But that's the concept. Now, Ellen White speaks of God and his omnipotence. In fact, in this particular reference in Signs of the Times of July 23, 1902, paragraph 12, she says, God is omnipotent, omniscient, immutable. He always pursues a straightforward course. His law is truth, immutable, eternal truth. His precepts are consistent with his attributes, but Satan makes them appear in a false light. By perverting them, he seeks to give human beings an unfavorable impression of the lawgiver. Throughout his rebellion, he has sought to represent God as an unjust, tyrannical being. So God is omnipotent. He is omniscient. He is immutable. Uh, Satan wants them to think, no, God's not like that at all. Because his law is like this. His truth is like this. Here's another statement. This is from Four Letters and Manuscripts, letter 92A, 1886, paragraph 4. God is omnipotent. Man <laughs> is finite. In converse with God, we may lay the most secret things of the soul open, for he knows it all. So when it says he knows it all, that means he is omniscient as well. You see, here's another statement. The Lord God omnipotent is the God of his people. He is also a tender, loving father, ready to hear their prayers. For God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, 
not imputing their trespasses unto them. God sent forth his son to be the propitiation for them through faith in his atoning blood. Notice it says here again that the Lord God omnipotent is our father. So if there's any question who, whom Revelation 19.6 applies to, it, it doesn't apply to Jesus there. It's applying to the father. He is the Lord God omnipotent. But does that mean that Christ is not omnipotent also today? As I said again, you could have a pilot and a first officer. And although they have a difference of rank, they both had the same power in authority as well as in ability to fly an airplane, don't they? Well, notice this statement from the youth instructor of June 21, 1900, paragraph 2. Not one of the angels could have become surety for the human race. Their life is God's. They could not surrender it. The angels all wear the yoke of obedience. They are the appointed messengers of him who is the commander of all heaven. But Christ is equal with God, infinite and omnipotent. Did you get that? In the 1888 materials, on page 1701, paragraph 2, the Lord Jesus is beside us, ready to grasp the hand that is outstretched to him who is, what? Omnipotent. He's beside us. She's speaking present tense in today's formula. Christ is there. He's ready to reach. You know, we reach out our hand to him. He's ready to grasp the hand that we reach out to him. And that hand, she says, is omnipotent. In Acts of the Apostles also, page 589, paragraph 2. The Savior is presented before John under the symbols of the line of the tribe of Judah and of a lamb as they had been slain. Revelation 5, 5, and 6. Okay? Notice those two symbols, Lion of the tribe of Judah, Lamb had been slain. These are symbols of different individuals or the same individual? Same individual. These symbols represent the union of what? Omnipotent power and self-sacrificing love. She says he has self-sacrificing love. He has omnipotence. Also, Signs of the Times, February 14, 1906, paragraph 4. All things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believe ye, believing ye shall receive. These words are the pledge that all that an omnipotent Savior can bestow will be given to those who trust in him. What kind of a Savior? An omnipotent Savior. That's what inspiration says, and I believe it. This day with God, page 193, paragraph 4. Our covenant with Christ unites with the majesty of an omnipotent king, the gentleness and tenderness of a caring shepherd. Please read the 42nd chapter of Isaiah. And here she refers to him as an omnipotent king. Christ is an omnipotent king. He's an omnipotent king, but he's also a caretaking shepherd. I like this statement. It says, by faith, by faith, we are to look calmly upon every foe, exclaiming, we fight the good fight of faith under the command of an what? An omnipotent power. Because he lives, we shall live also. Through Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith, we may withstand all the fiery darts of the enemy. Signs of the Times, May 27, 1897, paragraph 12. Now, when she speaks about this omnipotent power, how do we know she's not speaking about the Father? Maybe she's speaking about the Father's omnipotent power. But if you look at the beginning of the statement, again, it says, by what? By faith. We are to look calmly upon every foe. And then at the end, she says, through Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. And so we have faith, we have faith, and in between we have the omnipotent king who gives us the faith and, and this omnipotent power. Okay. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and verse 17, it says, Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty or there is freedom but Paul says that the Lord speaking of Jesus says the Lord is that spirit and I take this and I put it in connection with a couple things that Ellen White says she says this the reason why the churches are weak and sickly and ready to die is that the enemy has brought influences of a discouraging nature to bear upon trembling souls he has sought to shut Jesus from their view as the comforter as one who reproves, who warns, who admonishes them. Review and Herald, August 26, 1890, paragraph 10. 
And so she says, Jesus is the comforter, right? Jesus, Paul says, is that spirit. And then take that, and then we look at this statement in Review and Herald of February 6, 1894, paragraph 6. Look at this. A portion of the joy which was set before Christ was the joy of seeing his truth armed with the omnipotent power of what? The Holy Spirit, impressing his image upon the life and character of his followers. You say, well, I believe in the Trinity, Alan, because you see this speaking about the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is omnipotent. But the scripture says, and inspiration says, that the Lord is that spirit. And so if the Holy Spirit is omnipotent, of course Christ is omnipotent. His spirit is omnipotent. And this is really our hope, that we have a Savior who is powerful today for us. In Christ Object Lessons on page 333, paragraph 1, and I've quoted this statement to you several times, especially the latter part, but notice the first part especially. It says, as the will of man cooperates with the will of God, it becomes what? Omnipotent. Not that the will of man inherently has omnipotent power, but because we are cooperating and connecting to the source of omnipotent power. Whatever is to be done at his command may be accomplished in his strength. All his biddings are enablings. And of course, it's speaking of God, but we know that God works most everything through Christ, doesn't he? So, putting it all together, we have some statements also on omniscience. On omniscience. That's omnipotence. But let's look at omniscience. God is omnipotent, omniscient, immutable. We saw a similar statement to that earlier. Signs of the Times, July 23, 1902, paragraph 12. God is omnipotent, but he's also omniscient, right? Letters and Manuscript 16, letter 19, 1901, paragraph 13. Very simply, God is omniscient. No sin escapes his notice. We can't do something and expect to hide it from God, can we? Not at all. And then she says, in Manuscript Releases, volume 4, page 59, paragraph 1. The Father, the omniscient one, created the world through Christ Jesus. Manuscript Release, volume 4, page 59.1. But, just as we saw earlier, there was um, omnipotence that went throughout heaven. We see the omniscience too. It says, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, powers infinite and omniscient, receive those who truly enter into covenant relation with God. That's letters and manuscripts 15. Manuscript 27A, 1900, paragraph 10. And then in Sermons and Talks, page 2, or book 2, page 231.7. And I put this statement in here because sometimes we read things and we put something into it without thinking it through. So let's look at this statement now. The one great burden and grief of Jesus was that he, with omniscient eye, was viewing the destruction of Jerusalem. And she's speaking about when Jesus came in. You remember the triumphal entry? And there he was, but later up on the, on the hillside overlooking Jerusalem. And he wept, she says, with just irrepressible tears and sobs. But now, this is during the incarnation. She says that he saw this with omniscient eye. So what does that mean? You see, this is why we need a unified theory. <laughs> This is why we need a unified theory, because we can look at a statement like this and we can take it out of its context or we can take it out of its implications and, and make something out of it that it doesn't say. We could take this statement and say, well, see, it says that during his incarnation, Jesus had omniscience. But yet we have these other statements that, that teach that he didn't have this omniscience. Or we would at least say he didn't have use of that omniscience. So whose omniscience was this? is the omniscient eye of the Father, through Christ, working, you see. And so when you read these statements, you have to have a, a unified theory. You have to have some way uh, of putting them together. And, and the best illustration that I have found so far is this concept of how Christ could lay aside these divine attributes, clearly, discernibly, not with him, but then he could receive them back at any time he chose. He could have come down from the cross. He could have taken his omnipotence back and come down from the cross, but if he had of, the whole plan of salvation would have been destroyed and we would have been lost. If we can accept the post-resurrection omnipotence 
and omniscience of Christ, I think we've certainly proved our point that he has these abilities today, these full uh, complement of prerogatives of divinity. And so to recap the unification theory again, we stated that Christ was fully divine before the incarnation, possessing immortality, creative ability. He was omniscient and omnipotent, omnipresent by his spirit. During the incar incarnation, when he became a man upon this earth, when he clothed his divinity with humanity, he emptied himself, as it says in Philippians 2.7, of this form of divinity with the glory he laid aside his omniscience, his omnipotence, his omnipresence, his immortality, so that he could die for us. But Christ, because he was the Son of God, he could lay these attributes aside, yet never ceased accessibility to them, if he so chose. However, for the plan of salvation, he must, must, he must live demonstrably as a man depending upon the omnipotence and omniscience of the Father. But just as the high priest would put back on his high priestly pontifical robes, back on after serving in the plain linen robes of the common priest, so Christ received back his glory and divine attributes after his atonement upon the cross and his ascension to heaven. At least you think I'm a heretic. I said his atonement upon the cross, not the final atonement. No, there's a final atonement in heaven, a dual atonement. But this, this theory unifies the various statements of inspiration, which in some cases seem to say that Jesus had all of his divine attributes during the incarnation, and other statements which seem to indicate that he didn't. And so what we have left, friends, is a complete Savior who truly knows all of our issues and problems, and yet is divinely able today to help and to succor us in our times of need. And that's what I need today. I need someone who has set an example for me, who has shown me, yes, you can demonstrably do this. Because I depended upon power from God totally all the time. And now I have this power that you can depend upon me. And I will help you just like my father helped me. Aren't you glad for a Savior like that? I'm so thankful for that. I'm just so thankful I can't say enough about it. God has been so good to us. And if you will depend upon him today, he will bless you. He will help you. He, Jesus said, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. And he has the ability to come to us where we're at right now. It doesn't matter if we are at the bottom of the barrel, at the lowest rung of the ladder. We're below the ladder. And he can come and bring us up and carry us to the top of the ladder. Friends, I know that's true because that's what he's doing for me right now. And I need it because my life has been pretty bad at times. There was a time before I became a Christian, you wouldn't have wanted to have known me. It was pretty bad. But God has been gracious, and he's been gracious to each one of us. And may he continue that graciousness in our lives. May we take that graciousness and share it with others and tell them about a risen Savior who ever liveth to make intercession for us today. And may God bless you lots and lots and lots. Mm -hmm.